The Lord be with you. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Where the dawn of the east meets the twilight of the west and the cool of the north touches the calm of the south. The transcendent power of love touches earth in the humility of Christ. Here and now, the head of the Charles reaches out to the heart of the country. We gather for ordered worship. The liturgy, music, and homily this day are offered in the praise of God for our gathered congregation here and for our listenership near and far. Today we gather under the theme, After 50 Years, the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King in word and song. This Sunday culminates a year of Marsh Chapel remembrance of Bissell, Luther, Merton, and King, and culminates a week of BU King remembrance, Monday Gottlieb Center, Tuesday School of Theology, Wednesday Marsh Chapel University Worship, Thursday BU Central, Friday the College of Fine Arts. With gratitude and pride this morning, we welcome to our pulpit Governor Deval Patrick, whose voice, presence, and word we are proud to receive. May we who have remembered in these past days devote ourselves to the work of dismantling systemic racism and poverty in the coming years. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. As we are able, may we stand in the praise of God. Mr. John. 
May we pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, beloved, it is our practice to begin each week with a moment of quiet, of meditation, to recognize that but for the grace of God we would not be, and but for the grace of God we could not love, and but for the grace of God we should not speak. But by God's grace we live, we love, we speak. As the choir sings for us, let us lift our prayers of silent confession. Let us pray. Lord, guide us to remember the teaching of Scripture. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven us. Hear good news. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thanks. A lesson from the first epistle of John, chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 2. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed. We have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is a message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. 
and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us all from sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in reading responsively verses from Psalm 133 with the Antiphon.
How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. And now, beloved, please rise for the singing of the Gloria Patri, the reading of the gospel, and the singing of our hymn. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Glory Glory to you, o Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you.
be seated. Today we welcome as our guest speaker Deval Patrick, who came to Massachusetts at 14 when he was awarded a scholarship to Milton Academy through the Boston-based organization A Better Chance. After Harvard College and Harvard Law School, he clerked for a federal appellate judge and then launched a career as an attorney and business executive, becoming partner at two of Boston's law firms and a senior executive at Texaco and Coca-Cola. In 1994, President Clinton appointed Patrick to the nation's top civil rights post, Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. In 2006, in his first bid for public office, he became the state's first African-American governor. In his two terms as governor, Patrick oversaw the expansion of affordable health care to more than 98 percent of state residents, launched initiatives stimulating clean energy and biotechnology, won a national race to the top grant, and steered the state out of recession to a 25-year high in, in employment. Patrick currently serves as a managing director of Bain Capital Double Impact, where he focuses on investments that deliver both a competitive financial return and significant positive social impact. He is a Rockefeller Fellow, a Crown Fellow of the Aspen Institute, and the author of two books, A Reason to Believe, Lessons from an Improbable Life, and Faith in the Dream, A Call to the Nation to Reclaim American Values. Friends, when considering this very moment in our worship life in remembrance of Dr. King, I pondered who best to, to invite, who could represent in person and in voice both the history and also the present and future of King's legacy for our region and through our region for the country and the globe. One name alone surfaced, whose spiritual voice I heard at the memorial ac across the river for our beloved colleague of blessed memory, Peter Gomes, seven years ago, whose personal, even pastoral leadership supported us in the dark hours post-marathon exactly five years ago, and whose soulful voice challenged us at BU's commencement four years ago. So yes, I prayed, and yes, I pestered. One day, his delightful, long-suffering assistant called to say on a dark January morning, Dean Hill, pause. Tomorrow you will receive an email, long pause. It will make you very happy. <laughs> Indeed, it made me very, very happy. Please lift a warm Marsh Chapel welcome for Governor Deval Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Hill. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm glad to be with you all this morning. Honored and humbled in fact, but to be truthful, it's also a little daunting. I was asked to speak this morning about the enduring legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 50 years after he was killed a task that carries a special meaning here at BU, of course, where Reverend King became Dr. King, and to do it in the very sanctuary where he prayed in 20 minutes or less. Fortunately for you, but especially for those listening in on the radio and anxious for this morning's broadcast of the Moth Radio Hour, I was also given strict instructions to be brief. Dr. King is revered the world over for his message of love and hope. His famous I Have a Dream speech on the National Mall in 1963 is rightfully cited as a timeless and poetic call to the national conscience to be true to our founding principles of freedom, equality, and fair play. Less often acknowledged is the patience and discipline required 
to lead a nonviolent uprising of a people entitled to their rage, a people who had fought in every war since the revolution, who helped build the nation, and yet were systematically humiliated and excluded. To sense the frustration he had to overcome, read his letter from Birmingham jail. Take your time with it. It's a masterpiece. People sometimes dismiss Dr. King as being mainly good at giving good speeches, that it was just words. But he understood that the right words, spoken with conviction, are a call to action. In King's case, that action not only helped catalyze a series of historic legislative milestones, but also helped end a reign of terror and intimidation throughout the South and in many Northern communities as well. Thanks to Dr. King's words and the action they spawned, there is in many ways a completely different way of being a black man or woman in America today. We live and work and play and marry in ways that would have been unimaginable before King, a world of black corporate CEOs, black astronauts and scientists, black political leaders and university presidents and judges and surgeons, where in more settings than ever, African Americans can be recognized for ability and not marginalized by color. Whenever you hear someone trivialize the impact of words, think of how much action those words inspired within the lifetime of many of us here. I remember hearing Dr. King speak. It was in a park on the south side of Chicago, not far from where we lived, and my mother took my sister and me to hear him. I was about nine or 10 years old at the time, and candidly, I don't remember a single word he said. But I do remember how it felt, how I felt connected to all the people in that park, people like me, of limited means, but limitless hope. And I remember the power of that hope, the determination it stirred in us to make something better of our lives and our communities, indeed our country. I also remember how 50 years ago, around now, that hope turned for so many to outrage and violence right outside my window at the news that Dr. King had been killed. Today, Dr. King's work, America's work, remains unfinished. Black unemployment is low, but significantly lower, uh, excuse me, but still significantly higher than the average for white workers. Black people still earn less than comparably educated, comparably prepared whites. In fact, income inequality, a national concern, has only widened between blacks and whites since King's death. Meanwhile, black men overpopulate prisons and underpopulate colleges. In the midst of an increasingly knowledge-based economy, we have achievement gaps in schools all over the country, gaps in which poor kids and kids with special, special needs are stuck. We have people of every race and background who need work, but who lack the skills they need for the jobs there are. Cycles of violence, poor health, addiction, and despair grip too many communities in the very ways that concerned Dr. King 50 years ago. So when asked to reflect on this solemn occasion, lots of this comes to mind. Both the breathtaking progress we've made since King's death and the enormous challenges still before us. And while I'm glad to be here, and even more glad that so many of you are here, one wonders why, with so much left to do, we'd want to commemorate this grisly anniversary of such a profound setback. I think the answer may lie in the fact that we so sorely miss what Dr. King offered. For Dr. King offered us moral leadership. And we don't see much of that kind of leadership around here these days. We're in the right place to talk about that. Dr. King drew his moral authority from the church. He was a Baptist preacher before he was a civil rights leader and remained throughout his career steeped in church te teachings and customs. Those teachings and customs are familiar to me. 
On the south side of Chicago in the 50s and 60s, where and when I grew up, church was a big part of life. My grandmother was the featured soprano in her Baptist church, at least until she had some sort of falling out with the preacher. <laughs> After that, my sister and I were sent to the Cosmopolitan Community Church at the end of the block, bribed by the promise of a big country breakfast when we got home. Our Cosmopolitan was a quiet sanctuary, as black churches go, with a woman pastor, an uncommon thing in those days. Of course, we had in common with all black churches the transformative power of music and the watchful presence of old ladies in hats who took the business of worship seriously. One of the many lessons I learned in that church community was about the importance of having a moral foundation. It was never about sanctimony or any sort of moral superiority, just a, a set of ethical expectations the community had of us and most importantly, that we were supposed to have of ourselves. Those old ladies in hats used their moral guideposts in everyday life through old-fashioned notions that on the way to work on Monday, you don't leave your conscience at the church door, that faith is not just what you say you believe, but how you live, and how the best of them lived offered a moral example to the rest of us. It sounds a little too grand to say that in my time as governor, I tried to serve as faith, with faith as a moral rudder. I am no evangelist. I did not follow the example of one of my fellow governors who in the midst of a summer drought in his state convened a press conference to pray publicly for rain. Even by my somewhat relaxed Presbyterian standards, I am an unfinished Christian. I am certainly an imperfect man. Remembering my childhood lessons, faith is not a matter of showy piety for me, but rather of quiet acts of kindness and compassion. I try to do my job and try to live my life as Micah teaches, by doing justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly. Maybe it's simpler to say that I have tried to behave not so much as if God were watching, but as if the ones watching were those old ladies in church with hats. In my work as governor, that meant I tried to remember that there are human beings behind our policy choices, strivers and strugglers with aspirations and frustrations and anxieties. I tried to make policy matter where it touches people. Most of the people I met and served didn't want or expect government to solve every problem in their lives. They just wanted government to do its part to help them help themselves. A good school, a safe neighborhood, an expanding economy and the tools to ready themselves for it, a decent road, safe bridges, convenient trains. When I hear the conventional political debates about charter schools and teachers unions, taxing and spending, regulation and free markets, it strikes me that liberals and conservatives alike today have mastered their respective sound, bright, sound bites, but have lost sight of or maybe even interest in the people at the end of those choices. That mistake is easier to make than it ought to be. Jobs like governor are a blend, it turns out, of substance and performance art. And more and more of what counts, or at least what gets reported on, is the performance and less the substance. I remember announcing a significant breakthrough in legislative negotiations over one of our signature policy initiatives. I was so proud of this, only to read a headline the next day in the local paper about my brand new buzz cut. But once in a while, the substance breaks through. In 2010, with the help of many grassroots advocates, our legislature passed a reform of our Cori system. As some of you may know, this is the system that tracks every offender's criminal record. And it had become a practical barrier for many people with minor off offenses who were trying to get back into productive life. So we took on the tax task of trying to fix it. When the bill was complete, we hosted a signing ceremony in a packed, unair-conditioned un uh, building in Roxbury on what felt like the hottest day in the history of time. <laughs> Hundreds of people came, and despite the heat and the crowd, excitement was high. In the midst of the joyful pandemonium after I signed the bill, a man handed me his cell phone and asked me to speak with his friend. And the voice at the other end of the line thanked me for signing the bill and said he knew it would make a difference in his life. I said, I hope so, and handed the phone back to him. Four years later, I arrived early for an event in Springfield out in Western Massachusetts. 
We decided to grab lunch at a restaurant down the block from the Basketball Hall of Fame. And the troopers and I were waiting for our takeout near the front of the restaurant when a man in chef's togs walked past. He stopped, he did a double take, a frequent reaction I attribute to being taller on TV. <laughs> the man said, are you Governor Patrick? And I said, yes. The man said, um, do you remember signing Cory reform? I said, yes. I, and he said, uh, do you remember speaking to a guy on a cell phone right after you signed the bill that day? I said, as a matter of fact, I do. He said, I am that guy. He said, I was sitting in jail when you took that call. When I got out, I got this job on account of Cory reform. He had become the executive chef at that restaurant. Now that policy touched a person. Substance triumphed that time. And I believe that matters. There are statistics to show our aggregate results and awards to recognize our body of work, but that encounter reminded me, as I have been reminded countless other times, that what matters more are the human souls behind the policy choices. If we don't see the people behind those choices, the meek as well as the mighty, what morality do we serve? Like other decent people, I've been hurting over the church shootings in Charleston and in Texas. I've been in anguish over the shootings of children in schools in Parkland and Maryland and too many others, and of black men in Ferguson and Chicago and Sacramento and all the places that haven't made the evening news. The confrontation in Charlottesville makes me heartsick and angry, too. I've been wondering what these incidents say about the state of race relations in our country, about the state of our humanity itself. What kind of people harbor such fear of someone who looks like me that they shoot before asking questions? What sort of people see what the rest of the world sees in videotaped executions and still hold no one accountable? What kind of person gets so worked up about the presence of peaceable black and white people that he shoots them dead while they worship or go to school? And it's not just the physical violence we do to one another, but also the civic violence that concerns me. What kind of people are we when the men and women we sent to Washington or to our state houses respond to all of this not by tackling the root causes of violence in our communities, but by building walls between us and taking health care from us and starving our schools and our colleges and treating poverty as, as if it were associated with fault. What kind of president equates the historic experiences of African Americans with the grievances of white supremacists? And what kind of organization is the NRA that rejects outright any reasonable compromise on gun ownership to help children and others feel safe? What morality do we serve? There has always been injustice. There has always been hate. There have always been bullies. But it seems to me that in the face of it, we have less moral leadership right now than we need. In a way, the problem we face today is much the same as the one King faced all those years ago. In a sermon he delivered in Detroit while still a PhD student here at BU, Dr. King said, quote, there is something wrong with our world, something fundamentally and basically wrong. The trouble, he continued, isn't so much that we don't know enough, but it's as if we aren't good enough. The trouble isn't so much that our scientific genius lags behind, but our moral genius lags behind. We haven't learned how to be just and honest and kind and true and loving. And that, he said, is the basis of our problem. The real problem is that through our scientific genius, we've made of the world a neighborhood but through our moral and spiritual genius, we failed to make of it a brotherhood. Dr. King is still right. The point is that in too many places, whether the issue is racism or poverty or economic insecurity, we are at risk of becoming bystanders to injustice, unfairness, and suffering. I accept 
that we can be right without being righteous. I submit we need more moral leadership, not as a substitute for hard-headed practical solutions, but because moral leadership gives finding those solutions urgency and the solutions themselves meaning. Moral leadership is about more than religiosity. In the secular world, it's about keeping our civic faith. faith, faith. It's occurred to me lately how much of our democracy depends on unwritten rules, notions of restraint, integrity, respect, duty. Today, we live in a reality TV culture where a lack of decorum is entertainment. And in a time when religion itself has been weaponized to excuse or even justify all manner of ill will and ungodly behavior. We are outraged when our political opponents act out or act up and then look the other way when our political allies behave as badly. Indeed, it feels like hyperpartisanship is on the way to draining objective ethics out of public leadership altogether. As a man of faith, I confess to feeling frustrated by both sides. I can't help being perplexed by the self-described religious conservative. I can't understand how to square wealth worship with Christian worship. I can't understand how to square so much concern for an unborn child with so little concern for a child living in poverty. I can't understand how to square so much intolerance with Christ's countless examples of acceptance. I wonder if Charles Blow got it right when he remarked in the New York Times recently that being a religious conservative has become more about branding than behavior. And then there are my Democrats. My, my, my. I'm a proud Democrat, but sometimes Democrats get on my last nerve. As soon as conservatives start citing the Bible, we squirm uncomfortably. It's an odd thing because respect for the secular guarantees of the Constitution does not require us to yield the language or the lessons of faith. The gospel teaches that if we love Christ, we're supposed to feed his sheep. What's Galatians say? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. From my perspective, I'm a Democrat because I'm a Christian. Scripture teaches that faith demands action. Micah doesn't say to convene a commission and reflect on the abstract meaning of justice, mercy, and humility, but rather to do justice, love mercy, walk humbly, action not just consciousness, was central to the expectations of those old ladies in hats. Reach out to people in their darkest hour. Help the poor struggling to keep their heads above water. Encourage those who have lost not just their way, but hope itself. Sure, we should debate what part government role, what role government should play in meeting our moral obligations. But let us not forget in the heat of that debate that government is just the name we give to the things we choose to do together. Somehow we are forgetting in and about government today that social and economic justice was the point from the start. Still, I am hopeful. I believe we are not yet numb to the physical and civic violence on display all around us. I believe there are many more big-hearted, generous people than there are bullies and haters, more people whose patriotism leads them to revere the American commitment to opportunity for all than there are who feel their success depends on keeping anybody else down. I believe we have not yet forget, forgotten the people we were meant to be or the generational responsibility we have to leave the world better. But I do think we have to regain our moral voice. And with that, I leave you with this story. In my last year in office, the Obama administration asked a number of states temporarily to shelter some of the refugee children stranded on our southern border. Unaccompanied children, some as young as three and four years old, 
were flooding across the border, having fled over thousands of miles from violence in Central America, and the federal authorities were overwhelmed. Feelings around immigration run hot, I get that. Still, I agreed to help because accepting the challenge to temporarily shelter these poor kids fleeing unspeakable violence was for me an act of both patriotism and faith. We are an extraordinary nation, even an exceptional one. Unlike any other superpower, America's power, to paraphrase a great man, comes from giving, not from taking. America has given sanctuary to desperate children for centuries. We have rescued Irish children from famine, Russian and Ukrainian children from religious persecution, Camb Cambodian children from genocide, Haitian children from earthquakes, Sudanese children from civil war, and New Orleans children from Hurricane Katrina. Once in 1939, we turned our backs on Jewish children fleeing the Nazis, and it remain, remains a blight on our national reputation. The point is that this good nation is great when we open our doors and our hearts to needy children and diminished when we don't. My decision was an act of faith, too. I believe one day we will have to answer for our actions and our inactions. Jews and Christians are taught that if a stranger dwells with you in your land, you shall not mistreat him, but rather love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. In my faith tradition, we are admonished to take in the stranger, for inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, Christ tells us, you did it to me. Every major faith tradition on earth charges its followers to treat others as we ourselves wish to be treated. Still, I knew our offer of shelter would be controversial. Indeed, for that on hate radio, I was called everything but a child of God. A couple of days later, on an unusually quiet Saturday morning, my wife, Diane, gave me a list of stuff to get from the local Home Depot. It was early in the day, and I thought I would just run out quickly on my own without bothering the state troopers in my security detail. By the way, that was something they did not like. But I knew exactly where I was going and where to find everything on my list. So I set off in the truck, dressed in a t-shirt, jeans, flip-flops, dark glasses, baseball cap, didn't matter. I was outed by the manager in the very first aisle. Governor Patrick, he said, welcome to Home Depot. How can I help you? I encountered a man in the checkout line who was angry. He wasn't rude or threatening, just angry and loud. And he yelled at me, Governor, I couldn't disagree with you more about your offer to shelter these children. He said, my own wife is an immigrant. She came here illegally. That's the way it ought to be. I want you to know that I think you are wrong. I thanked him for his feedback. And let me tell you, it was clear to everyone in the checkout line who was mad at whom and what he was mad about. I had six other encounters on the same subject in the store that morning. In each of the other encounters, someone came up and whispered, Governor, I'm with you. Governor, you're doing the right thing. Governor, thanks for standing up for those kids. The calls to the offers were two and three to one in favor of sheltering those children. It struck me how we've come to shout our anger and whisper our kindness, and it's upside down. I don't know whether that's on account of our hate radio, reality TV culture, and I don't care. We have to learn again to shout our kindness, to shout our love, to shout our compassion. Surely that's the moral leadership Dr. King showed us and that we crave. Blessedly, we're starting to see more and more of that across this country. From women who are demanding to be treated with the respect and decency everyone deserves, from the black and brown people who are demanding consistent professionalism and the presumption of innocence from police, from students who are demanding we choose their lives and safety over the proliferation of military weapons, 
from all those lawyers who showed up in airports after the Muslim ban, who demanded respect for the rule of law, even for people some despise. Black Lives Matter, Time's Up, Black Girl Magic, Occupy Wall Street, the NFL player who takes a knee. You may see in these and similar actions different folks standing against different wrongs. Some of it may even make some of us uncomfortable but in a larger sense, all of them, all of us, are part of what Dr. King called a coalition of conscience. People regaining our moral voice to resist injustice, to call BS, to shout kindness. Moral leadership rising. So on this solemn anniversary, let us acknowledge the acts of courage and defiance, large and small, that Dr. King and his allies performed, the moral leadership they showed in their time to make life a little better for us. And then let us ask ourselves, what now in our time are we going to do? God bless you. Dear friends, as we join our hearts and minds in prayer, I would invite you to assume an attitude and posture of prayer by remaining seated, standing, kneeling, or coming to the communion rail according to your tradition as we join in our call to prayer. Lead me, Lord. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who hast brought us thus far on the way. We confess this morning that Dr. King's dream is as yet far from a waking reality. We confess that we do not yet live out the self-evident truth that all people are created equal. We confess that not only Dr. King's children, but worse, his grandchildren, are still too often judged by the color of their skin rather than the content of their character. Thou who hast by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path, we pray. Our hearts grieve today that the promissory note for the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness remains in default. Young black men continue to be slaughtered not only in the streets but in their own backyards. 1.5 million black men are absent from our midst and from their homes and families for having been jailed. Too many in our society toil and labor, yet are unable to cobble together a living wage, and our children must make the trek to school 
in fear and trembling. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee, lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. We in the church would like to think of ourselves as the Good Samaritan, yet drunkenly stray from the path, committing sins of idolatry. We, the church, confuse the Bible for God, whiteness for purity, masculinity for Christ-likeness, the nation-state for the realm of God, and money for salvation. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand, true to our God, true to our native land. O God, send your spirit to ignite within us the fierce urgency of now. O God, send your spirit to cleanse from our hearts the drum major instinct to delight in praise. O God, send your spirit to fix our eyes on the promised land that Moses and Jesus and Gandhi and King dreamt and saw and entrusted to us. And God grant that we shall choose the highway, even if it will mean assassination, even if it will mean crucifixion. For by going this way, we will discover that death would be only the beginning of our influence. Amen. And let us pray together in the words that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, beloved, and welcome to Marsh Chapel at Boston University. On this low Sunday, the first Sunday after Easter, on which we pause to remember the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we are glad you are joining us, either here in the nave at 735 Commonwealth Avenue, listening via radio or internet waves at 90.9 WBUR or WBUR.org, or later via the podcast. Today and every day, we seek to be a heart in the heart of the city and a service in the service of the city. If you are new to Marsh Chapel, we hope you may identify yourself to one of the chapel staff after the service so that we can introduce you better to this vibrant and diverse Christian community. If listening from afar, check out our website, bu.edu slash chapel, or send us an email at chapel at bu.edu. We're delighted to get you better connected. I call your attention to a few brief announcements. Following the service today, there is an opportunity to visit the Howard Gottlieb Archival Research Center to view archival materials and historical documents related to Dr. King. More information can be found in the community announcements section of your bulletin back here. 
Next Sunday, Marsh Chapel's engagement with Johann Sebastian Bach continues with the Bach Experience at 9.45 a.m., led by our Director of Music, Dr. Scott Allen Jarrett, and the full performance of the cantata Loba den Herrn Meine Seele at 11 a.m. during the service. University Chaplain for International Students, Jessica Chica, has a brief announcement related to the chapel's ongoing sustainability efforts. Uh, good morning, everyone. I just wanted to bring your attention to the uh, community announcements page. Uh, there is a section entitled, Are We Climate Ready? Next Sunday at 1230, our Marsh Associate Savannah Wu will be leading a, a discussion about Boston's climate readiness for climate change. Um, I wanted to also let you know that your feedback to that uh, discussion will be given to the city of Boston to direct them on how to move forward. So very important, please uh, consider attending. There will be food um, served as well. Thank you. The Dean's annual Boston Marathon brunch this year will take place on Patriot's Day at Brugger's Bagels in Kenmore Square at 10.30 a.m. Enjoy food and fellowship and then catch a glimpse of the various race leaders making their way through Kenmore Square. Finally, mark your calendars for the Inner Strength Gospel Choir's concert on Friday, April 27th at 7.30 p.m. and their symposium titled The Evolution of the College Gospel Choir on Saturday, April 28th, beginning at 10 a.m. A complete list of chapel activities and worship opportunities is available on the chapel website, bu.edu slash chapel, where there is also the opportunity for online giving to support the mission and ministry of Marsh Chapel. As the choir continues to lead us in worship and prayerful meditation, please remember it is both a gift and a discipline to be a giver.
gracious and ever-present God, we raise these gifts before you, a few notes in the endless songs of our lives. Bless and sanctify these offerings and ourselves so that they and we may ring out your hope over earth's lamentation and greet with joy your gift to us, a new creation. Amen. The sun shall warm and bright on you, your darkest night a star shine through, your dullest morn a radiance brew, and when dusk comes, God's hand to you, the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be and abide with each one of us now and forever. Amen.